And welcome to another episode of Strange Planet. Thanks, as always, for sticking me in your ear. And if you'd like to get deeper into Strange Planet, here's what you need to do. Just click on that link in the episode description, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, uh, or... Um, Sorry, not or. That's it. <laughs> Just click on it. And uh, the, once you uh, go there, you'll see there are three different monthly tiers or programs to choose from. Choose the one that's right for you, that makes sense for you. You gain access to commercial free listening, uh, bonus episodes, and uh, a subscription to my monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum, discounts on Strange Planet merchandise and more. Strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm all right, we are going to talk extraterrestrial contact on this episode. And um, over the next little while, I'm going to be bringing some guests to you or introducing you to some guests and speaking with some people who are a part of a, uh, a great conference that's happening in Las Vegas, November 10th, 11th, and 12th at the beautiful Luxor Hotel, the uh, Egyptian ballroom. It's called Stairway to the Stars. And um, my next guest is going to be speaking at Stairway to the Stars. I believe he is scheduled to speak on the 12th of November. Uh, if I'm wrong about that, he'll – no, the 11th, my mistake. Uh, November the 11th, that's the Saturday, again, at the Luxor Hotel at the Stairway to the Stars. And uh, for more information, go to DisclosureFest.org, DisclosureFest.org. Just about everybody, anybody, <coughs> anybody associated – um, with UFO disclosure and um, alternative information is going to be there. It's uh, it's just a fantastic conference. All right. Uh, Barry Littleton is with us. He was born awake with fragmented past life memories. He started having extraterrestrial contact experiences at the age of seven. Also included were experiences with ghosts and various inorganic beings Barry also has psychic and mediumship abilities, and these things led to a lifetime of researching the paranormal and metaphysical. He has a degree from Wichita State University, majoring in psychology, sociology, and ethnic studies. Barry, welcome to Strange Planet. How are you? Hello, Richard. To have good will. Thank you for having me. I'm very honored to be here and to be a part of the conference. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. So thank you for having me, and it's nice to meet you. Without giving it all away, can you just kind of tease what you're going to be uh, talking about at Stairway to the Stars on Saturday, November the 11th? Sure, sure. I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the different modalities of extraterrestrial contact and the contact phenomenon itself. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about black holes and the Akashic Records and also about uh, Earthbound Spirits. And um, kind of some work I'm doing there and I've been doing for a while with earthbound spirits and kind of the difference between earthbounds that are on the inside of the energy field and the ones that are on the outside of the energy field. So we'll talk about that and also might touch on uh, melanin dominant black extraterrestrials also. So ah, that's, something right. that, that's something that isn't talked about very much. So no, kind of I'd like to bring that to light. I've not heard that before. Well, we'll we'll touch on that as well uh, during our uh, our conversation right now. But I do want to start with at the beginning, when you say you were born awake, what does that mean? Well, um, I mean, when first um, having memories that didn't go with this life, and several of them, and, you know, and I think that actually that is not really that uncommon for a lot of us, especially at this cycle that's going on right now, people being born with past life memories. And uh, so that was one thing. And then um, also being able to perceive what seemed like I could hear people's thoughts to a degree. And it didn't take long before I started interacting with things that were, you know, apparitions, ghosts, and things like that started coming around. And I didn't understand fully what it was at first. But uh, so when I say awake, that's what I mean. It seemed like I was born with all this stuff turned on pretty pretty strong <laughs> right right and fragmented past life memories uh can you describe what some of these past lives were like yeah one of them would have been i think in what we would call pangea you know before before um things were like what we call egypt and the civilization that was before that and it going to uh other lifetimes like i have one of you know being an actor and i think that was recently you know probably hundred or so couple hundred years ago and uh, having actually, you know, passing, like getting out of a, 
uh, carriage and having a heart attack and dying, people being around me, you know, like things like that. And just certain, especially when you start looking at history, certain things you're attracted to and geographically as well. And you wonder like when they're going to come, what, when you're in class, when are they going to start talking about that historically? And they don't, it doesn't go like beyond Columbus or whatever they're doing, but does it go into the empires that existed here in the past or any of the extraterrestrials that are here or anything that's enlightening that makes sense well as you're experiencing this as as a young boy seven years old younger maybe um i mean how do you process this information when you see you know i'm not like my friends this isn't happening to them uh do i tell my parents how are they going to react how did you process how did you deal with this you know i i for the most part i wanted to try to dismiss it as imagination but when there were actually physical experiences, you can't really do that. You know, you wake up not in your house and you're like on board some craft or in some room where you're being, you know, instructed mentally, telepathically to like, there's a counter and like to move the feather that's on the counter. And then there's a bowl of water, then just make the water stir. Okay, then there's metal balls, you levitate those. That's the third thing, the hardest thing to do. You know, and I kept thinking, you know, I was, I was waking up here in this place and it was a very lucid, awake experiences all of them and then you know going to school you're burned out you feel like you haven't slept and it's like you're living kind of you know two lives in a way it's it's uh somewhat disturbing but for me i was one of those individuals that enjoyed field trips and as a kid and they kind of felt like that to a certain degree the and ultimate I'll, field i'll trip. say that as far yeah and as far as contact experiences i'll say i could speak for myself and i think what might be the majority of I had positive contact experiences. This weren't negative. I wasn't being abducted. This was more encounters, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. I think the difference that they're calling now between abductees and ex experiencers is most valid. So. Often these things are generational. Um, did it happen to your parents? You know, I can't say it did, but my mother, my first experience was seeing a UFO, actually seeing it like at close range. This was with my mother when I was there at the seven years old, actually. And that's when things really started ramping up for me at seven years old. So in that way, um, you know, I think my mother was aware that something was going on, but I didn't really talk about it either. And number one is because I couldn't prove it. And then I had something happen in the sixth grade that was so incredible that it crossed over from this other thing I was doing, this other life into my normal daily life. And it was no doubt that what I was having to me was not delusion, which I was worried to, you know, what if that's why I started studying psychology. What if something's like wrong with the chemicals in my brain and I'm just freaking out, man, you know, that's why <laughs> you're delusions studying. or something. That's I, why did, you're I didn't studying. think so, but I, but I wanted to make sure, you know, and try to delve into that. That led me into dealing with psychology and dealing with hypnosis and things that are conscious. And I hadn't, I was unaware at that time, you know, until only a few years ago, would I really say, how much the contact scenario is a conscious event, an event of consciousness. It's not just all physical. So for me, I was having stuff happening, but it seemed like it was, you know, it was astral and it wasn't in the physical body. So for me, that wasn't as tangible as when I can go up and touch something, you know, and look at things and you're really standing there. You have actually have a body. It's, it's slightly different, you know. What happened to you in the sixth grade? <clears throat> I had what I call the acid rain experience. I had woke up and I was on board this craft and there's a screen, okay? It's not a window, but it's a screen. And outside of the screen, I can see what appear to be three UFOs that are over this, we're over um, a mountain pass, a snow top pass. And I've never seen anything like that before. So it's something really stands out. And these ships are sucking up what looks like clouds into their underbellies and then they're emitting like light. And <clears throat> excuse me, on the side of this this um this deck plates is what we would call an insectoid being mm -hmm. that's floating over these deck plates. And this is actually someone that had come to me physically and played with me. Okay. And when I say that to you, he didn't appear to be an insectoid like he did on this ship. And this says a lot with what these beings can do through our optic nerves consciously. He appeared to be a kid, and I thought he was at that time because he's playing with me, but he had on these kitty cats and like a, a a ball cap that's kind of pulled down low. But in that way, he didn't look like, you know, somebody say, oh, that's a that's a grasshopper looking insectoid right there. 
It wasn't like that. But on this craft, he had on a uniform and it was the same presence by all means. And he was just different though. And he felt like a, a scientist, ancient by all means. And um, that's, he's over these deck plates and he's telling me that the, um, they're trying to, that the acid rain is very bad for our planet and they're trying to help reverse it. And he went into the microwaves and metals effects, what I call m and m which has said the metals are very dangerous that are in our atmosphere and also the microwaves. And that these are things that are bad for our planet and reasons why some of them don't come off those craft very long. So this stuff is, you know, coming through. And I'd never heard, Richard, I never heard the word acid rain, okay? And I know I've probably been criticized a little, but during these experiences, when you're really in the in the presence of a non-human and within their biofield and you're getting like a, a rush, a type of a charge, Almost what I think I uh, call it like what the um the gurus call it Shakti Pat. Mm -hmm. When the guru touches the apprentice and it releases their chakras and their kundalini, it feels somewhat similar, I think, if you're around beings that are not these grays or reptilians, but these beings that are on the higher, higher levels. Um anyway, so and what he looked like for a description, I've got on my YouTube channel, I've got illustrations that I show of this being, he looked like a grasshopper with milky colored eyes, okay? Not the typical praying mantis we see like that. This being didn't look like that. But he was about the size I was when I was in the sixth grade, all right? And a little, well, maybe even a little smaller, actually. But anyway, so um, that's what this being actually looked like and uh, this acid rain thing. Now, fast forward, um, in class, sixth grade class, my teacher, good old Miss Crow, she would have us read something every Friday that was called the Scholastic News. And she would choose one traumatized child to stand up there and read the, the main article. And I was that child that week, that, 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 that week, you know, of all things. And it's so where you get up there, like you don't want to be mispronouncing or misspelling things. And you're like, oh, Lord, he can't read that type of deal, you know. Anyway. <laughs> but <laughs> that is traumatizing. This. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll never forget this one because on the front of this scholastic news was the Statue of Liberty. And the article that I read was about that that year, um, the Statue of Liberty was being shut down parts of it because they were repainting it and doing reconstruction due to damage from acid rains. Uh -huh. CFCs have said that. And I never, you know, and I, I, I and right then that's when, I mean, it hit me like a brick. I remember saying it real loud, like, as it rained, and everybody started laughing like I was joking around, but the truth is, it, it shocked me so much, because it's where this is definitely, I thought knew it was real, but I mean, there's no doubt about it, you know, that this go, this crosses over, the, right. that's where it kind of, and I like science, and it's cool to have at least have a little bit of science to back this up, so it's not all, quote, woo-woo, unquote, right, uh, anyway, but yeah, so that would be the acid rain experience, and that's when I knew what was happening to me was very real and then it was trying to plan on how could I prove it was happening and why was it happening? That's kind of what went. That, that leads to a type of obsession too. <laughs> uh, uh, are, are all of your um, memories of encounters conscious memories or are any of them like retrieved through uh, regression therapy or? What a great question, Richard, you know, for years, I was against, I, I was a conscious experiencer and, you know, but despite that, I was still having, during these encounters, I was having these huge amounts of missing time. All right. So after one of these encounters happens and all I can say this, when you're not in the face of some of these beings or around the technology and the further you get from the event horizon, the more difficult the retention of memory is. And mm -hmm. so things start, as my brother would say, things start getting like that. You know, but um, that's just the further you get away from. So and that way I went on for years saying, oh, I'm not like Travis Walton or any of those guys. I'm just a conscious experiencer. But I was missing all this time. <laughs> so then so then I went and got um, learned hypnosis. And it was strictly to try to self hypnotize myself for the missing time, because in each of OK, these experiences that I mentioned, the sixth grade experience. But there was a few years going like through high school that I didn't have any experiences. I'd say they stopped about a little over 13 to about almost 17 and they ramped up again. Okay. So there's that, there's that place there, at least um, not that I would call considered like the other ones. So I go into the, the adult onset experiences 
And that's where the missing time started happening. And, you know, three of those times, somebody else was with me. And that type of delusion is not shared. They see the ship come up, they see it. And all of a sudden, you know, you're missing time, but you realize that you've been, you've had this experience. You're around these beings. The information is still there, but then it starts fading. So in that way, with time, I eventually started focusing on these missing time and not just focusing on only all these things I could remember, which were a lot of details, a lot of details, you know, because I'm very, I'm, I'm one of those, if you were in school with me on a field trip, you wouldn't have liked me because I was one of those kids that was going, oh, what's that? What's that? What's that? Everybody, <laughs> be quiet. You don't know, run off from the group. You know, I, I was one of those kids, get lost. You know? <laughs> I think I would have liked you just fine. Um, <laughs> Mary, we're going to yeah. uh, we're gonna take a quick time. I will come back and discuss more of your extraterrestrial contact. Stay with us. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Barry Littleton is with us, experiencer, contactee, has had experiences with earthbound spirits and uh, remote viewing, NDEs. We'll get into uh, as much of that as we can as time allows. And um, what we don't get to, well, you just have to go to Las Vegas, November 10th, 11th, and 12th, to the Stairway to the Stars conference put on by uh, the Disclosure Fest Foundation, disclosurefest.org for more information. And uh, Barry is speaking on Saturday, November the 11th. That's uh, again in Las Vegas at the beautiful Luxor Hotel in the Egyptian Ballroom. And um, tickets and more information again at disclosurefest.org. And just a, a who's who of uh, people in this uh, field will be there. Richard Dolan and Nick Pope and Johnny Enoch and Laura Eisenhower and Jason Quitt and so many others. Uh, I, I, it would take me half the show just to name them all, but Barry will be there. And again, speaking on uh, Saturday, November the 11th, um, we were talking about some of your, um, your contacts and uh, you talked about missing time uh, and how you were able to recover that through self-hypnosis. Uh, and you also mentioned, though, that there were people you didn't realize with your conscious memory, but through uh, recovered memory, through uh, self-hypnosis, you uh, uncovered some of that missing time. Did you discover then who who was on the on the craft, let's say, with you that you didn't know before? Well, you know, a lot of those things I, I couldn't remember. Oh, you could. So it was more homing in on on what what was actually missing in between and the information that was slipping away too so you know i found i i learned you know hypnotize other people easy and quickly but i couldn't do it to myself i had to <laughs> i had to actually go lay down or sit down and have somebody else do me and do professional regressions with me so i had about seven of those done and then um to be honest um i was shocked from the amount of information that came out of them it was way more than I had anticipated. And it it expanded what I thought I knew, you know, by like a thousand times. What did you and gave what did you it, learn? it gave even more questions, you know? Well, things that like, for example, um, I had a memory of these craft being organic. 
at least the ones I have been on board. And when I say organic, that the inside, like the walls, and that's the thing about a physical experience, you can actually touch something and the touching the walls inside of this craft felt like, um, it felt similar to like what we call toadstools where I live, but the, the, mm -hmm. the mushrooms, but the, the consistency was harder and they looked like very, very solid. And in that way it was, you know, I knew it was organic and it, you can feel it. And for a long time, you know, I, 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 I always wondered why all of these beings, some of them being phased out, some of them physical, and, you know, they're in your mind telepathically. And a lot of them, like, for example, the insectoid, which is one of the few that gave me a name, a name would look like, sound like Yandar, but it's Xandar, uh, D-A-R. But anyway, um, he was answering my questions before I could formulate them telepathically in my mind. That is a bit disturbing, even if it's not an attack. You know, it's just not a way we're used to communicating mm. uh, in advance like that. And, and then more than that, the information that comes in is like, it's a bunch of it. It's it's compacted. And it can take, you know, years to uncover what all that information was. Like, for example, these craft, this is something I could remember, them telling me that the craft were made out of these components, four components. One, which would be what we would call quasi-crystals, okay, a crystalline type of uh, substance, quasi-crystals is most of what I've seen in our science now, these odd lattices that they're making in the labs with these crystals. Um, another thing would be metals that are mined from planets that are devoid of Van Allen belts and atmospheres and the type of solar radiation that they have a resistance to the metals there. So you're looking at uh, metamaterials, okay? And then also, then you're dealing also with um, a fungus, a fungus, a mycelium of some type, and then the DNA of the crew or chromosomes of them. All that, this combination is actually grown over like a micro wormhole or over a, a black hole. So that's where, that's why some ways, like the inside, the engine, and some places this craft are displaced on the inside. And the reason why when I was there physically, I'm getting really sick. Like being on a merry-go-round when you go down, or I'm uh, sorry, a roller coaster, you go down, it takes your stomach. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I know what, now why I hate merry-go-rounds. And like them as a kid, it feels like being on one of those craft. Uh -huh. And then you're getting bombarded telepathically. The air is, to me, smelled on most of these craft, smells a lot like Windex to me. Interesting. And so, yeah, so these things, you know, are things that are causing what they call temporal aphasia is what they were telling me telepathically. And this temporal aphasia is, you know, the sickness that comes that if it get, becomes too much, it will actually interfere and disturb the, the contact experience. And in that way, like where I was, I'm sorry, I don't think I could survive there very long, depending on how long the actual that was in the first place but i think it's it's fleeting the time that they they meet us there so in that way when i've seen i have seen people and experience when they started again 16 17 uh i saw these people on board this craft touching this living light and i've actually got pictures of this I, <clears throat> when i woke up around i'm around this engine that looks like um a gyrosphere with the ball in the middle and the ball now i can tell you was this golden ball that had these hexagons in it looked quite similar to what they say c60 looks like um carbon 60 quite similar to that yeah it takes it in a, all into that like a honeycomb bunch of picture. yeah and it's emitting a light that's going up and this thing is big okay but the first deck i can like see people up there but they're kind of phased out like trans trans transparent mm -hmm. partially and I want to go up there when I get up there and it's weird. You want to go somewhere in these crafts, suddenly you will be there and then you get even more sick. So I'm looking at these people and I'm watching them. There's a group of about, uh, what was it, about eight people and they're walking, seven, eight people. They're walking over one at a time and touching the living light. That's what the beings are calling us, the living light. You know, and I can't see any of the crew members. They're beyond my mortal vision, but I can see these people. And my point for saying this is, you know, a couple of those people that have come in my life i've met them one the person the first person i did interview with a gentleman named bill spicer he's an author pilot and um engineer and experiencer and another person um i can mention her names uh, for instance susan manwich who i've become pretty good friends with and she's done quite a bit in the free energy movement and some other things so you know and these are people that are having experiences 
Did and it's it's somebody people I saw beforehand, like years before I was like seventeen, years and years ago. You know, did they have memories of seeing you on board. You know, Bill Spicer doesn't remember seeing me, but I tell you, he sure remembers the ship and the technology. When he showed this, I had a lot of most of my sketches done by Kassara, Christine Dennett. And uh, he tripped out on when I actually had the engine and especially the black box. This light went up and the top of this craft was this huge black box. And uh, that's where the light went up to. And he remembered the box and this, the sketches. Um, Susan recognized it a bit, but she didn't have the memories that Bill did, you know, but it's like neither of them seemed to remember seeing me. And I'm thinking, how could you not see me when I'm over there, the throwing up guy, but a guy about to throw up. <laughs> but, you know, them being there when being taken by located with their energy body, their dream body, that's how they were having that experience. That's why they were partially transparent. And guess what? Uh... They weren't applying to the same physical laws as me that I'm getting sick. And this whole thing's about to be over, you know, so but for them, they're just experiencing in in that realm. And it's quite interesting. I know now. So I don't I don't discount people when they say they have these astral and conscious experiences because that's the big part of it. That's what most of it is. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever heard a um, an experience or a contact go into such detail about what they saw on the craft and what they, what was communicated to them telepathically. Uh, Barry Littleton is with us. He will once again be at the Stairway to the Stars conference happening November 10th, 11th, and 12th in Las Vegas at the Luxor Hotel in the beautiful, uh, that is the Egyptian ballroom. And yeah. come back and uh, talk some more right here on Strange Planets. Stay with us. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Barry Littleton is here, barrylittleton.com. And uh, also you can check him out on YouTube. What do you talk about on the YouTube channel? Oh, a little bit of everything. Yeah, so everybody wants to check that out, please go to the uh, playlist. I've got my personal encounters on there, the sketches I've done, uh, which is a lot of them. And I go into detail, not just about my experiences, but what I've learned. And sometimes it's things that absolutely fascinate me, you know, or things I've had contact with, like, time travel or time time to time science we'll say thing all stuff like that's on there sometimes scripted stuff there's about um over 300 videos on there that are short but to the point and it's to inspire people to do their own research so uh i'm on your website and we're going to shift gears here for a moment because i'm looking at a, a picture of you in a hospital bed uh, hooked up to all kinds of monitors. You're in a neck brace. You look like you're in pretty rough shape. Uh, what happened? This was, um, well, you tell me when was this and what happened and tell me about your NDE. Yeah, that was um, September 28th of uh, 2010. I has I was on my way to work and I had a bad car accident, my Trans Am. And um, I actually had, uh, with my great intelligence, wasn't wearing my seatbelt as it was only less than a mile from where I lived. And I went through uh, several of the windows and took four catastrophic traumatic brain injuries. So I took a hematoma to the frontal lobe, hematoma to the um, brainstem, 
hematoma to the quarter lobe. And then I have what's called diffusion axonal, which is actually somewhat of shaken baby syndrome, spotting of the brain. And my brain had turned in the case as well upon impact. So uh, yeah, I, I definitely have better days. On the way to the hospital, I died, I think twice, they twice, and they brought me back and um, they told my family I would probably most likely pass from the brain swelling and everything else. But uh, I was in a coma for two weeks, about to, actually about 12 days. And then uh, it took about um, about a half month to remember who I was. Wow. And at that point, when I say that, you know, things eluded me, like my pattern of decision making and stuff like that, you know, but I had what they call a clearing out, which is where a brain injury patient remembers everything and comes back. But, you know, interestingly enough for me, that was just after I was talking to my uncle and my grandmother, my uncle, we had just buried him like two days before I had this accident. And I'm talking to him and my grandmother, and this isn't like some vision. Richard, it's like I'm talking to you now. Mm -hmm. It was a you know very real experience, and um, that's when after speaking with him, I woke up and uh, he had told me I was hurt bad, but I didn't believe him. But then when I woke up, I came awake in this fall best fall fall wrist bed. Kind of looks like Spider Man put you in there, you know, looks like webs or something. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, that's kind of how that went, and um, they said that I would be a vegetable devoid of long-term life memories and uh, things of that nature. But I had a very definite near death, near death, near death experience and the creator saw it different and I'm blessed to still be cognitive. And for clarification, my experiences started <laughs> decades before the scar accident. So that has you know, nothing to do with discredit what I had experienced before that previous that. Right. Right. Or after for, or after for that matter, I could say that now. <laughs> uh, <in> addition <laughs> In addition to talking to your uncle and your your grandmother, what else happened uh, while you were in a coma? What happened, or or during the actual um, time that you had flatlined, basically twice? What 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 did you see? What did you experience? I I saw I saw you know what I what I call um, you know there's the book there's a book called the Aranta, and the Aranta book has an, it has names for different types of angels, and one of them are called super nanophim. They're a type of archangel, but slightly different. I believe I saw beings like that. They were of light. They weren't human. They weren't physical beings. These were light beings. And they were, only word I can use is regal. They were like thousands of strings of light. And then, I, you know, I... Look, I'm a Star Trek geek, okay, but I, <laughs> I, uh, outside, outside, the, when the light comes to a point, it, like, these shields is the way they look like to me, like these shields, and they would come to that, and then outside of that, it kind of looked like heat, when you, uh, when you, when you see like a mirage on the road, you see, you know, the, the steam that comes up, the waves, yes. They're like these waves coming outside of the shields, and they, then with so much love, coming off of these beings that I think they had to been turning it down a lot or it probably would have fried my physical body. I mean, we don't think about love hurting like that outside of our common human relationships. But this is a whole nother frequency. And um, I'm sure that each one of them channeled creator energy, healing energy in the over hundred people that came and saw me, you know, through that room, that window and stuff. I think they channeled that to heal me to what you see now to help. I think it's a definite part of what got me here. So, and had it not been for that accident and everything that I had lost after and just getting my life back, I probably never would have truly come forward. I said, I, I said, I always said I was, but that was just talk, Richard. This, this isn't conducive to anybody's career. And, you know, <laughs> say, hey, no, hey right. uh, you know, not, not just that I had survived a bunch of brain injuries, but hey, I would say an extraterrestrial since a kid, since childhood, that goes over real good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Put that on the resume, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so when you came back, uh, oh, first of all, during the ND, I mean, Typically, we hear about you know the the uh, the beam of light and and um, I don't know maybe visions of paradise uh, being welcomed by dead relatives. Any of that? Well, my 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 uncle and my grandmother, you True. know, I, I'd seen them, but I think that part of this is also I was only so far there, not fully there, you know. And I sp I spent a great deal of time from a psychological 
aspect or viewpoint trying to figure out how much of this was actually the last oxygen in my brain that was processing through mm. is how much of that's what I was seeing versus how much of this was my brain responding to external stimuli. Right. You know, there's that, 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 that leaves a type of a nebulous part there, but I can say this reality is real to the perceiver. And had I not come back here, I would have been there. So that, uh, and you know, it's, it's fascinating, Richard is, how closely I found out now when dealing after dealing with uh, Ray Hernandez quite mm -hmm. a bit, who deals the yes. free uh, CCRI, and, um, how closely actually the near death experience and lifeline lifelong contactees are connected. How how many of us are you now? I've spoken at several of these conferences now, and sometimes I'll ask, "How many of you are contactees?" People raise their hand. Keep that hand up. How many of you've had near death experience? And the people that have both hands up is the several people in the crowd. So it's quite common that they're connected. Yeah, know, I was uh, e in contact. What do you think it is? Uh, I, I was as you were saying this, I was remembering. Um, well, Whitley Strieber has told this story many times, and I talked to Whitley about this as well. And that's the connection between whatever he experienced, contact whether they're interdimensional, those extraterrestrials, I don't think he's even necessarily figured it out, but he, he witnessed during these events, seeing people that he knew had, you know, had died years ago. So what do you think is going on here? Have you figured it out? You know, that's very interesting because, you know, uh, Preston Dennett has done a lot of work over UFOs that are seen over cemeteries, mm. shining lights down on graves. And that takes us into, is that some type of like necrophilia we're dealing with, clone process, or how much of this is also us dealing with our life, our soul life memories. There is a problem on this planet. When we incarnate as immortal souls, a lot of people will agree that our souls are immortal, mm -hmm. but yet when we incarnate here, we're mostly devoid of soul life memories. So that's like, man... You're like in the 12th grade, you're about to graduate high school, but you can't remember kindergarten to 11th grade. Mm -hmm. That kind of sucks, in my opinion. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I think, and I think, and especially when it comes to a lot of us have not just past lives here on this planet. When you look at a show like, well, what, what, what used to be called uh, Ghost in, Inside My Child, where they talk, talk to the kids that remember, like the one kid remember being in 9 11, mm -hmm. and he's reincarnated already. And, you know, having doing hypnosis of past life regression it's fascinating how often people come back and every time during these regressions i've done which is many of them now it's always been the person's choice where they incarnate and when never once have one of them say well the light is making me do this or 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 my guide my angel is making me incarnate and do this here it's never been that it's a choice and the evolving of the soul it, it's it, it's quite fascinating you know so some of the things that we're told aren't always true sorry i may have went off from what you just asked me i apologize I that's all right about Earth Doesn't matter wherever, you, <laughs> wherever you want to take it it's it's uh it's a great uh journey no i was just wondering about maybe the connection between you know whitley streber seeing um people at the same time as he had these strange encounters with extraterrestrials and interdimensional seeing a friend that had died uh, I think it happened a couple of times. You mentioned the connection between near-death experiencers and contactees. I mean, how do how do we explain it all? You know, and some of that takes us also, not just what I was saying about the soul life memories that may be with these other races and other so these extraterrestrials or interdimensional existences we may have had, but also here just on Earth, the fact that um doing dealing with the astral and the inorganic part spirits and that's the place where that can come together you know like for a long time i would i would wonder like where is the position like for example i had to realize that the beings i saw when i died these these super nanofem are different than even some of these higher extraterrestrial interdimensional non-physicals i've seen on board these craft I think they're going for the same thing with the creator, pure creator consciousness, but they're, they're different. Their levels of energy and vibration is different. Does that make sense? But, and, and so in that way, I think, but when we're dealing with um, people that have passed over, 
And there, a lot of these experiences happen midway through, you know, like where I saw my uncle, like almost, let us say, um, almost like a corridor between mm -hmm. the, between the different densities, right. I think. Yeah. So, and, you know, and some of it could be, um, the, so the question is, was it actually these people that like Whitney saw, or was it extraterrestrials using the, their holographic image or projection? You know, there's a lot, lot, a lot of unknowns here. <laughs> yeah, most of it, I think, ultimately. And if we ever figure out what's going on, it may be nothing like we can, like we're imagining. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, you know, dur during, during, like, if I were to do a past live between lives regression, and you go through this process just naturally, you know, a guy shows up. And it's without, without me saying, if you're under, I say, hey, Richard, are you seeing your guide yet? It, it, it's not like that. They just naturally come in the process. And normally they take the client to what will be like, I call a place of um, translation and reconfiguration, where it could be an office, a library, even a nature spot. But they're always these ledgers and these books. And they'll pull one up and open it. And it's this life, that the, or the life that we're going over with, with the client. And they go over and they start saying things. There may be other souls present. They say, I have agreements with them. They never say contract. It's always been agreements. And we're going to help each other several lives. Unfortunately, it's normally the people they incarnate with that are screwing them over. But it is <laughs> what it is. <laughs> and they did it several lives. You know, they, they teach you, yeah, yeah, thanks. I want to make an agreement with you to please screw me over when I incarnate. Oh, man, come on. But it, it is what it is, you know. <laughs> well, school, school is now in session, right? <laughs> remarkable um you know we didn't we didn't get a chance to talk about um everything including melanin dominant extraterrestrials but we have to leave something on the table so that you can you know people can go and see you at stairway to the stars <clears throat> happening in las vegas at the luxor hotel november 10th 11th and 12th and barry you'll be speaking uh in the egyptian ballroom on uh, saturday November the 11th. And again, people can go to disclosurefest.org and check it out again. Stairway to the Stars, November 10th, 11th, 12th in Las Vegas. And uh, Barry will be there. And um, Richard Dolan and uh, my gosh, William Henry, Jason Martell, Nick Pope, um, Stephen Bassett. Uh, it's just a who's who. So check it out. Disclosurefest.org. Barry, uh, what a pleasure meeting you, and I uh, really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for this. We'll have to do it again. Hey, thank you for having me on, and I'm looking forward to Vegas. Never been there, and uh, thank you, Richard. Really appreciate it, and letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So, Help me fight big tech censorship, enjoy the complete unedited episodes, and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Welcome once again to another episode of Strange Planet. Thanks as always for sticking me in your ear. And just a reminder, if you'd like to dig deeper into Strange Planet, you might become, you might think about becoming a premium subscriber. It's real easy to do. Just click on the link in the episode description, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. 
anchor.fm. And there are three subscription programs to choose from. Choose the one that's right for you. You can gain access to commercial free listening. You can get bonus episodes and a subscription to my free monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. On this episode, we're going to delve into forbidden archaeology, human devolution, consciousness, and the Vedas. And we're going to do that with a, a giant in the field, Michael Cremo, also known as the forbidden archaeologist, is hailed as a groundbreaking research pioneer and international authority on archaeological anomalies. His landmark bestseller, Forbidden Archaeology, first published in 1993, and has been translated into nearly 30 languages. It challenged the very foundation of Darwinian evolution. Michael continues to dig up enigmatic discoveries in the fossil record and shake up accepted paradigms, exploring famous archaeological sites around the world, journeying to a sacred to uh, sacred places in India, appearing on national TV shows in the United States and other countries, lecturing on mainstream science conferences, or speaking to alternative gatherings of global intelligentsia and uh speaking of which he will be appearing at stairway to the stars that is happening november the 10th 11th and 12th on the las vegas strip at the uh, beautiful luxor uh, luxor uh, hotel and i believe michael will be appearing on the sunday that's november the 12th Michael Cremo, welcome to Strange Planet. How are you? I'm fine. How's the Strange Planet? <laughs> <laughs> well, as you well, I don't need to tell you. It's uh, it's not only stranger than uh, we imagine; it's stranger than we can imagine. Um, let's just uh, talk for a minute about Stairway to the uh, the Stars. Again, you're appearing on uh, November the twelfth. That's at the Luxor Hotel. Um, I'm guessing in the Egyptian ballroom and uh, in Las Vegas. So what is what are you going to be talking about? All of this well, we're going to talk, talk about tonight? Uh, well, I don't want to give away the whole, no. whole talk, but oh, no. uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, some mainstream scientists who are at least beginning to think about the idea that there may have been a very ancient, advanced technological civilization on this planet, perhaps going back many hundreds of millions of years back to the geological period called the Silurian. So that's kind of interesting, and I'm going to give some details uh, about that. It's a uh, kind of a, a new thing because mainstream scientists have generally ignored the evidence for extreme human antiquity that's come to light. That's uh, that's really, you know, what we're talking about in a nutshell, extreme ancient antiquity um, when it comes to advanced human civilization. Um, let's talk about sort of the traditional human evolutionary timeline so the earth uh, is four and a half billion years old um modern humans supposedly originate in africa within what the last two hundred thousand years and maybe three hundred thousand there some of them are prepared to say these days right right okay so let's let's give the alternative uh human evolutionary timeline according to your research well uh, when I look at all the evidence, not just what's in today's textbooks, but when you look at all the scientific reports from archaeologists, geologists, other scientists digging into the earth, you get an entirely different picture. You find many reports of human bones, human artifacts, human footprints going back far, far, far further back in time than two or 300,000 years. And in some cases, many millions of years, even hundreds of millions of years. So the pattern that emerges is not one of evolution of human beings from more primitive ape-like uh, creatures, but rather one of coexistence of humans like us with creatures resembling uh, 
different species of what could be called ape men, or they're called technically hominids, Australopithecus, Homo erectus, Homo habilis. They've got different names for them, more recently Homo nilidae, the Denisovans, and creatures like that. So uh, basically humans like us have been coexisting with them for vast periods of time. And that's what I'd expect to find if our universe actually has a purpose. I think it's kind of like a, a virtual reality uh, system that we're in to learn some things and to understand what our real nature is. So I think given that purpose and the fact that these things can be understood in the human form of life, means the human form of life has always been available for conscious selves who are finding themselves in this virtual reality system that we call our universe. So can you um, give some examples of um, evidence of modern humans coexisting with what are supposed to be our, our, our ancestors, but you're, you know, that that's not quite right, but give me some examples of, of, uh, evidence, uh, whether we're talking about, um, I don't know, footprints or bone fragments or, or something like that. Yeah. Well, I'll give some examples that are fairly close to what modern science is now prepared to accept. Uh, in 2016, there was a team of archaeologists working at Ulduvai Gorge in the country of Tanzania and East Africa. And they found in an excavation a finger bone. Now, th this may seem like a, a minor detail, but it's kind of significant for what it shows about how scientists look at evidence. They analyzed the finger bone. It was actually the proximal phalanx of the fifth finger. In other words, this, you know, the little finger is made up of three bones. The first one is called the proximal bone. So they discovered that bone and they analyzed it very carefully. It was found in layers of rock 1,800,000 years old. That's around the time Australopithecus was existing. But they carefully studied this finger bone and they found it was different from any Australopithecus finger bone that they had found. It was different from all species of apes and monkeys. And they also compared it with a sample of modern human finger bones. And they saw that it fit in the modern human finger bone group, not in any of the hominins or uh, other species of apes and monkeys. But uh, they said, this, is, this finger bone is most like that of Homo sapiens, modern Homo sapiens, in other words, like us. But we can't call it that because of its age, 1,800,000 years. So this is a, a, a case where they find evidence that humans like us were coexisting with Australopithecus 1,800,000 years ago. But because of what I call knowledge filtering, they, they can't bring themselves to, to say that. I mean, they directly said this in their scientific report. We looked at this finger bone. It's different from Australopithecus. It's 1,800,000 years old. It looks like Homo sapiens, but we can't call it that. So this goes on all the time. If it only happened once or twice, you could maybe excuse it. But when it happens hundreds of times, or like the case of the Laetoli footprints, also discovered in East Africa by Mary Leakey in 1979. 
she looked at the footprints in her original scientific report. She said, these are just like anatomically modern human footprints. Other scientists also agreed. Paleontologist Tim White said, there's no mistake about it. They're just like the footprints that you or I would make if we were walking on a beach today. Uh, but they didn't accept that they were made by human beings like us. They thought, well, well, there must have been some kind of ape man, some hominin, some species of Australopithecus that was living uh, around 3.7 million years ago. That was the age of the formation in which these footprints were found, you know, so again, they were thinking, how can we explain this without bringing in the forbidden idea that humans like us were coexisting with these ape, ape man-like creatures? You know, they scientists have actually discovered discovered the foot bones of Australopithecus, and they did not have a foot exactly like a modern human foot. You know, they're first toe would kind of move out to the side like uh, the human thumb on the finger. The other toes were also kind of long. You know, their foot structure was more like that of a chimpanzee than a modern human being. So these are just a couple of fairly recent examples. Uh, but if you want to go really far back in time, we could look at the California gold mine discoveries that were made in uh, the mid 19th century during the gold rush days in California. Miners were coming from all over the place to dig into the sides of mountains for the gold. But they were finding in their mining tunnels human bones and human artifacts in layers of rock that modern geologists tell us are about 50 million years old. So uh, you know, you've got discoveries like that. Why were they re rejected? I mean, they were reported to the scientific world by Dr. J.D. Whitney, who was a Harvard University educated geologist who was the chief geologist of the state of California, and he published a, a massive study about these discoveries. But they were rejected by other scientists because they contradicted the theory of evolution. So, as I said, if this happened just a few times, well, Maybe you could say, well, yeah, there are a few anomalies, but the vast majority of evidence supports you know, the standard view of things. But we're not talking about just one or two. There are literally hundreds of these discoveries. Yeah, it, it begs the question how these cases managed to slip past the gatekeepers, uh, because you mentioned you know, knowledge filtering which I guess now maybe they've perfected this and, and uh, you know, these types of reports aren't going to get, aren't going to break through or do they, I mean, are, are we continuing to see these reports coming, coming forward or have they got it pretty well perfected this, you know, knowledge filtering and locking these, these stories away. So nobody, nobody can see them again. Well, I think that does go on. But a lot of it is kind of unconscious in, in the sense that they, that was the significance of the first case that I mentioned, which is fairly recent, where scientists find something. You know, they're looking at it, it's staring them right in the face. You know, like the finger bone, they analyze it, it's human in shape and form, it's not like anything else. You know, it sh it should set off alarm bells in their heads, but because of this knowledge filtering process, because they're so committed to their current paradigm, and they're not able to think outside the box, they think, how can we make this fit? Uh, 
you know, it, it's just really amazing sometimes uh, the, the the links they'll go to to not question question the paradigm, but somehow or other make it fit by saying, well. You know, maybe there was some kind of ape man back at that time who did have a human-like finger bone or a human-type footprint. It's the the other way they get around it. Say in the California case of the California gold mine discoveries, well, there must have been some hoax. There must have been. They must have. The artifacts must have slipped down through some fissure. There were some earth movements that changed things around. And, you know, if you're going to proceed in a scientific way, you can't just give a list of possible ways in which something could be wrong. You actually have to prove that in this particular case, yes, there was a fissure, you know, that could through which artifacts of the type that were found could have slipped down that fissure into the place where they were discovered. Or if you're going to claim it's a mistake or a hoax, well, identify the person who committed the hoax. You know, and if you have five or ten different hoax stories, how do you know if any of them are true? You know, it's... Uh, it's kind of a, you know, I've encountered this again and again. You know, when I bring these cases up to people in, you know, the scientific world, especially the world of archaeology, one of the first things they do is give a list of possible ways in which something could could be wrong. I mean, I mean, once I responded to one archaeologist who was making such a case that, well, for all I know, you could be a, a holographic projection from Mars. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about what, I mean, anything is possible. But, um, Michael Cremo. As, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to sort of reset, reintroduce. Michael Cremo is uh, with us. And, of course, the groundbreaking work of the hidden history of the human race, forbidden archaeology, divine nature, a spiritual perspective on the environmental crisis, forbidden archaeology's impact, human devolution, the forbidden archaeologist, the Atlanta rising, my science, my religion, academic papers. And uh, he will be appearing at Stairway to the Stars at the Luxor Hotel uh, November uh, the 12th, Sunday, November the 12th. However, the um, the conference Stairway to the Stars is running for three days, Friday the 10th, Saturday the 11th, and again, Sunday the 12th of November. Disclosurefest.org for more information. Disclosurefest.org. Uh, uh, we'll take a quick timeout, come back, and continue to discuss. Stay with us. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.
Michael Cremo is with us. Um, I think the the one example you gave where human remains were found in strata that were dated about 50 million years. What is the earliest indication that uh, this race were tool users? Um, they, the, among the artifacts that were found in these layers were obsidian spear points. And obsidian is a very difficult uh, material to work. It's like volcanic glass, really. But so it takes uh, quite a bit of intelligence to manufacture a spear point or an arrowhead out of obsidian. Uh, if, if, it, if they're able to do it, they're really quite effective because it's, it's quite sharp. So, uh, but, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, as far as technology goes, some discoveries go back to the hundreds of millions of years. Uh, of course, the further back you go in time, the more scarce the discoveries become. Because if you look at the geological history of the Earth, uh, due to plate tectonics and things like that, layers of rock are being destroyed. You know, So it's not that we have the complete record. You know, especially as you go further and further back in time, you know, there are some geologists that say that over the vast periods of time that the Earth has existed, about 95 to 90 percent of the sedimentary layers, which is the layers in which you would find fossils and artifacts, have been destroyed. So... Uh, Another factor to consider is like our our high tech stuff, you know, like laptop computers and cell phones, cars, jets, all that stuff doesn't last very long in the geological record. We tend to think it's pretty solid stuff, but most metals will oxidize, plastics will dissolve eventually over over the course of hundreds of thousands or, or millions of years. And, you know, but stone tools and weapons still persist in time. So I don't think we're getting a complete record of uh, what past civilizations were capable of because a lot of that high tech stuff doesn't last very long in in the geological record. So even though, say, 50 million years ago in California, some people were using obsidian spear points, stone mortars and pestles, other people may have been using more advanced technologies that simply haven't come down to us to the present day. And the, the only way that you might recognize it is by, say, doing some chemical analysis. And if you can find uh, remains of compounds that don't naturally occur in nature, you could say, okay, they had some type of advanced technology. And it's just survived as some remnants of some metals that they may have used. So according to this timeline, is would this suggest that the history of modern man on this planet is, is um, one that uh, begins perhaps as a primitive civilization? It rises to a certain apex of technological advancement, then the some, I don't know, cataclysmic event occurs and it's like hitting the reset button. It starts again from a primitive standpoint, rises again, falls, and that is the history of 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 humankind on this planet, rising and falling from primitive to technological advanced civilizations? 
Yes, uh, that's certainly what a lot, a lot of the people in the ancient wisdom traditions thought. The Greeks and Romans certainly thought that. Plato said civilizations have come and gone, risen and fallen many times in the long history of the earth. Aristotle said the same thing. Ancient Egyptian priest said the same thing. Uh, and yeah, I'm a follower of the Vedic tradition, and it, it also has uh, periodic catastrophes that take place. They kind of match up in some ways with uh, what uh, modern paleontologists call extinction events. You know, they say there have been in the long history of the Earth over the past couple of billion years, maybe five or six, the number varies slightly, uh, major extinction events, the last one being uh, the asteroid that struck the Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs and a whole bunch of other species. So, yeah, I, I think there have been periodic catastrophes that have uh, destroyed human civilizations that have existed on this planet. But I think there's a system in the universe Kind of like something like cloud computing. You know, if you have a device, you know, a cell phone or a laptop or a tablet, you can store your files, your songs, your videos, your pictures, everything in the cloud so that if your device becomes inoperable, you can get a new device and download everything from the cloud. So I think there's an arrangement, something like that. There are beings who exist at higher levels of the universe that are beyond the, these periodic devastations that take place on our level. And they have the resources to, you could say, reboot the system, download the, uh, uh, the information for you know, body plans and things like that. So I think that that has gone on for the whole history of the cosmos. And, you know, I, I think there are these vast cycles of creation and destruction that go on and on and on. They're endless, which makes me somewhat different than... Uh, either a modern scientist or a creationist in the sense that I think it's always been here. It's always been going on. You mentioned um, when we were talking about, you know, some event that hit the reset button on on um, technological advancement and, and, and civilizations and so forth. And you mentioned cataclysmic events as being the reset. Um, would that include ancient nuclear war? Uh, that is something that could have happened if we look at, uh, I mean, when I look at the ancient Sanskrit histories, they speak of weapons that re re resemble modern nuclear weapons. They were called brahmastras. When they would be set off, it would be like, they would say like 10,000 suns in one place, you know? And I mean, as I mean, many people know now because of the film about Robert Oppenheimer, you know, he was aware of some of these statements in the Vedic literature. And when the first atomic bomb was tested at Alamogordo in New Mexico, when it went off, he started reciting some of those texts. Now I become but, death. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, well, it's kind of interesting, you know, that after the atomic bombs were set off at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he and Einstein and some other atomic scientists got together and formed an organization that put out what they call the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. And in 1947, they started something called the Doomsday Clock, 
and they were kind of worried about how close the world was getting to a nuclear war. Because immediately after America developed an atomic weapon, Russia developed one, and you know, it looked pretty bad. So they set the doomsday clock to 20 minutes to midnight, midnight being nuclear catastrophe. This year, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists set the clock at 90 seconds to midnight. And they said, this is the closest the world has gotten to nuclear war than it ever has before. I think many people don't realize this, but, you know, I mean, I'm a kind of an old guy. I kind of went through the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Berlin Wall Crisis, this crisis and that crisis. But they say this is the situation we're in right now is worse than that. Mm. Um, You mentioned Oppenheimer. I don't know if this is an apocryphal story, but supposedly he was asked after the detonation uh, at uh, Trinity, something to the effect, is this the first nuclear explosion you've ever, or that's ever occurred or or something? And he said something to the effect, um, not in my life, or yes, in my lifetime, in my lifetime, suggesting again that there were perhaps ancient nuclear conflagrations. Um, do, do we know if that story is true? Did he actually say that? Well, the way I heard it was, he said the first in modern times. Ah. It it seems to, I don't know if that was documented on a television show or videotape because some of his statements about Bhagavad Gita, you know, the Sanskrit text that, has that uh, verse in it about time I am, I've become destroyer of everything. You know, that that is on videotape. This other statement, I'm not quite sure if it's on videotape or not. I'd have to look at it again. But it's I've, I, I'm fairly certain that he did say it. And I've mentioned that case just as you have any other evidence um for a an ancient nuclear war on earth well i've heard reports that at a place called mahenjo daro which is now in pakistan but it's a a city that dates back to what they call the Harappan civilization or the Indus Valley civilization that existed 5,000 years ago, you know, around that time. And I've seen reports that uh, outside that place, they've done yeah, there's high levels of radioactivity and that some of the uh, some of the places have this green glass that is, you know, like when you set off an atomic weapon, it turns the sand and rock into a glass-like material. So I haven't been able to verify that. You know, I mean, you you see lots of reports like that. Uh, There is a place in Africa where some people claim there's a natural nuclear uh, reaction going on, but maybe that's not an ongoing natural thing, but the remnants of some, as you were saying, ancient nuclear war. Well, according to the the Sanskrit text, when did this nuclear war take place, if that's in fact what it was? Well, this has, if you go through the text, you'll find several references to weapons like this being used. The most recent ones are about 5,000 years ago, 
at the time of what's called the Kurukshetra War, which is described in the Mahabharat. Uh, it's that's there. And there are other accounts in the Vedic text of use of such weapons going back much further in time. So, uh, yeah, there, there are examples like that. Michael, we'll take another quick time out. Michael Cremo stays with us, the author of Forbidden Archaeology. Back with more in a moment. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Michael Cremo is with us, and again, he will be appearing at the Stairway to the Stars conference. That's happening on the Las Vegas Strip at the Luxor Hotel, uh, November. <clears throat> excuse me, November tenth, eleventh, and twelfth. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Michael will be speaking on Sunday the twelfth, and uh, you can get more information at disclosurefest.org. Disclosurefest.org. Um. So if modern man has always walked the earth for perhaps hundreds of millions of years, uh, and we are to then sort of throw this whole idea of, of human evolution, where did we come from? Well, that's a, a great question. It's a question many people ask me after they read the book Forbidden Archaeology. You know, they, they said, okay, you've got all this evidence that contradicts the current theories. What's your explanation? And I tried to answer that question in the book Human Devolution, a Vedic alternative to Darwin's theory. And what I propose there is that, you know, be, before we even ask the question, where did human beings come from? We should first of all ask the question, what is a human being? And I would say that uh, we are beings of pure consciousness. That's what we really are. And what we call the human body is a vehicle for that conscious self. Now, most scientists today wouldn't agree with that. They would say consciousness is just produced by chemicals interacting in the brain. The other neurons there, they... They are kind of like a computer network, and you know you've got some kind of advanced networking going on, and it produces consciousness, but only temporarily. At the time of death, they say, when chemicals in the brain become disorganized, no more consciousness. I don't accept that. I think nobody has really shown how you can get consciousness out of chemicals. I mean, they say it, but nobody's demonstrated it. And that means to me, the conscious self consciousness can exist apart from the brain, apart from the body. 
So as conscious, intelligent, personal, individual beings, which we all are, and it's something we can directly experience, it's not a matter of belief. Everyone can experience, I'm conscious, I'm an individual, I'm a person. It's the most real fact of our existence. So I think that consciousness persists, it exists apart from the body, apart from the mind. So as, as conscious beings, we don't evolve up from matter. I would say we devolve or come down from some level of the cosmos that is dominated by pure consciousness. And we come down to this level and get covered by uh, mind and matter. And those coverings are what we call a body. So I, I think that the bodies, I mean, we're in a human body now, but there's many other types of bodies available. There's bird bodies, insect bodies, dinosaur bodies, fish bodies, bird bodies, there are all kinds of bodies that we could occupy. But the human in the human vehicle, we have an opportunity to understand what our real position is and qualify ourselves to attain a position on that higher level of the cosmos where there's no limitations of the kind that are imposed upon conscious beings in this world uh, having uh, temporary vehicles that come into existence, last about 100 years maximum, and then disintegrate. You know, it's... Uh, uh, and we know we're not meant for that. I think deep in our hearts, every one of us isn't really satisfied with being in a position where we're constantly dealing with something that's a vehicle that's coming into existence, disintegrating. Again, of course, I'm a big believer in reincarnation, that you know the, the self will go on in another vehicle, uh, hopefully human, but maybe not necessarily. So I think th this whole system is something that's been set up for an educational purpose for us to learn these lessons. And it's almost like if you have, if we put a space station into outer space, you know, we don't just hope that somehow or other the chemicals inside the space station are going to combine together and form some first living thing that will gradually evolve and become an astronaut. No, we put the space station up because we've got astronauts that we're going to put in there right from the beginning. You know, so I think our universe or spaceship Earth or our galaxy or whatever it is has a purpose and it has something to do with consciousness and the human form of life. So I think the human form of life has always been available. If we accept uh, this paradigm uh, of um, the, 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 our timeline here on Earth and, and accept that this is what we are and who we are, uh, or if it could ever be proven, how does this change things here on, on Earth? Well, it changes things in a big way because our values and goals and objectives in life are pretty much determined by how we identify ourselves. And for many centuries, scientists have been telling us we're machines made of molecules in competition with each other for survival. In other words, they're giving us a very materialistic sense of identity uh, and therefore it's not surprising that people's values and goals 
and objectives in life are quite materialistic. I think people think, well, to got to work, you know, got to produce, consume more and more material things. That's our purpose. And it, and we do it not just individually, but in terms of vast competing groups. And that process of material production and consumption and competition and conflict generates a lot of wealth. And it flows into certain pockets in a not exactly fair way. So there are huge institutions that have been built up, financial institutions, political institutions, military institutions, educational institutions, scientific institutions that are all based on keeping this sense of identity intact. And because of it, people naturally behave in ways that can be they can be manipulated, they can be exploited, they can be put into conflict with each other. So but if we had a different sense of identity, I'm a being of pure consciousness, you're a being of pure consciousness, we're all beings of pure consciousness, no need to divide ourselves up into co competing, conflicting groups on the basis of superficial identities like nationality, race, whatever, religion, even. Uh, we can find out how to satisfy our material needs in the most simple, natural, efficient, and fair way possible while putting most of our human energy into developing our resource of consciousness. And trying to raise consciousness to the state where it completely transcends all of the limitations that are imposed upon conscious selves on this level of reality. So it's, uh, you would have a different, a different culture, a different set of institutions that would be quite different than those today. And there, I think there are a lot of forces in the world that don't want to see that happen. They want to keep things as they are, keep everybody as you know, in the rat race, so to speak, because they profit from it and they benefit from it. What do you suppose is the best way to lift this veil um, or this lid of secrecy on our, our true identity and our true history? And if I might add, do you see any role for artificial intelligence in the fields of archaeology and anthropology that might aid in that regard? Well, I, I think we're already dealing with artificial intelligence in the sense that as conscious selves, I think we really do have a kind of eternal intelligence, an eternal mind, an eternal consciousness, and on this level of reality, we identify not with our real self, with our real intelligence and with our real mental capacities and capacities for love, but we're dealing with a reflection you know, that we identify with. You know, we tend to identify with the particular bodily vehicle that we we occupy and instead of the real self which is within so i think a lot of artificial we're already kind of dealing with a kind of artificial intelligence in that we built up a whole civilization based on this false identification but uh yeah, you know, it's a question that I'm really interested in. You know, artificial intelligence, perhaps there is some use for it. But you now I was at a conference in, it was in Encinitas, California. It was a 
put on by uh, a group that specializes in consciousness studies and some of the leading scientists involved in that field from around the world were there either physically or remotely and one of them said something very interesting now she was working on what she called artificial emotions because uh she was thinking Okay, we've got artificial intelligence, which can organize words and ideas and things like that. But there's people have a dimension of their lives that goes beyond intelligence, you know, the ability to organize and analyze things. There's emotions and feelings. So her study is involved in getting uh, machines, in other words, computers, robots, things like that, to recognize emotional states and interact with someone, not just on the basis of whatever they type in to chat whatever version you want to Say 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 that you know some artificial intelligence uh, uh, program, but she wants these machines to be able to recognize, analyze human emotional states, and then communicate with people in such a way that it manipulates their emotions and takes advantage of them. And I think it's, in one sense, it's very interesting and exciting. But on the other hand, it's very scary, you know, because, you know, politicians, uh, corporations, they have a whole science of, you know, through advertising and communication and things like that, of dealing, you know, with people's emotions to get them to do certain things so to have this kind of thing being worked on um in the same way that ai is being worked on and uh, unleashed upon the world i i don't know if i would want to be confronted with a, a machine that was analyzing my emotional states and trying to manipulate them in order to uh, get me to do something. Well, but anyways, the whole whole field. Well, this is maybe this is the next cataclysm. <laughs> uh, always the specter of nuclear war, I suppose. But there's also the specter of uh, you know our losing our humanity, and perhaps this is the last fully human uh, generation. Maybe this is our cataclysm. Maybe the inventor of um, uh, art, machine learning and artificial in intelligence uh, would would echo the words of uh, Oppenheimer from the Hindu text, now I become death. Well, Michael, um, yeah. again, let me uh, remind people, you are appearing at the Stairway to the Stars happening the 10th, 11th, and 12th of... Uh, November at the Luxar Hotel on the Las Vegas Strip. And more information can be found at disclosurefest.org. Disclosurefest.org. Um, any future uh, events you'd like to mention as well? Well, uh, the end of this month, I'm going to Zurich in Switzerland and uh, at a place near there called Winter Tour. I'm taking part in a conference on science, spirituality, and world peace, where I'll be talking about some of the things I mentioned today. Uh, and after that, I'll be going to Budapest, Hungary, to take part in a conference there. So I don't know how many people are going to make it to uh, Europe, but maybe you've got some listeners over, over there, and yeah, they could... Check in my website, mcremo.com, you know, for information about those events. All right. And we can find those links, your link, mcremo.com, 
uh, humandevolution.com, uh, myscience, myreligion.com, forbiddenarchaeologist.com. All of those links are in the episode notes right here on Strange Planet. Michael, a delight to, to speak with you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Richard Serrett's A Strange Planet drops every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.